Good evening. This is the uh, Great Jew Atheist, and this is podcast number 24. And uh, tonight's topic is evolutionary psychology. And, um, and by the way, uh, happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there. And today, tonight is November 22nd, 2018. And um, tonight's subtopic is uh, evolutionary psychology in a half hour. So let's see if I can make a quick explanation of this very, you know, difficult topic. It's not easy. Um, and so, you know, let's start with two definitions. Uh, psychology is the study of the mind and behavior, right? And uh, evolutionary psychology is basically the, the extension of uh, evolution to the study of mind and behavior. So how did evolution, this, you know, this science of how species were created and formed, impact behavior, okay? Um, just a little background on, on me. Um, I was a, a religious person and I remember, uh, you know, and so I, you know, I remember even in high school, I had my biology textbook, and I said, we weren't created from no apes. And um, so I remember that. And, um, and you know, and, and it's funny, at the same time, I remember going to the public library, and um, I, would re I was fascinated by the head zoology books. And I had, you know, I, I would look at the you know, zoology, and I especially the uh, monkeys, and I see so many monkeys, and like I would notice like they had these weird pictures of these South American monkeys and monkeys from Africa, and I said, wow, you know what, they look a lot like us. And then, of course, the teacher never went into evolution because even then, 19, okay, 1982, it was still, a, 1981, whatever, it was still a very controversial topic, and... Um, but I, you know, I started to read in the uh, textbook the uh, evolutionary psychology um, entry, and um, I was like, "I'm sorry, the there was no evolutionary psychology." You know, I, I didn't even know about it, and I said, "Wow, you know, this is pretty interesting." And um, and I said, "You know what? There could be something to this." You know, Darwin and. And I saw a picture of Darwin, and um, you know there might be something to this. And um, I mean, those monkeys look a lot like humans. And I saw chimpanzees, and I said, "Wait a second, you know, maybe I've been sold a bill of goods." And you know, but at that time, my uncle came over, and he, for some reason, we we're talking about religion. And he said, "Where was God when Hitler killed the six million Jews?" and I said, yeah, where was God, you know? Was and I came to the conclusion that the relationship with animals weren't just a coincidence. Um, and I saw that the uh, biblical account of creation could not be true, right? Um, so at this point, I, you know, first of all, I became very skeptical of religion and... I then started to, you know, look around, and I started to say, you know, this evolution is definitely something to it, and I still wasn't totally convinced. It's probably at the stage uh, three of the five-step uh, um, progress of change, which I think I talked about in a prior, the trans-theoretical theory, and, um, you know, and then, you know, a weird thing happened, you know, the chicken and egg type of thing, but I think at first I said, well, okay, the evolution is most probably true. And I thought, you know, what's interesting is maybe there could be some psychological mechanisms of evolution. Like maybe something like anxiety could be something that evolution might have evolved, that evolved in us. And, and then I thought, well, you know, you know, maybe you know, people say, oh, anxiety is bad. Got to solve it, and then I thought, oh, maybe it's good, you know, maybe because I always had like an open mind to things, and everyone's so red. And to this day, I mean, it's funny. I just, 
at Thanksgiving dinner with my family, and I mean, I've i been in a really good mood lately, and right now I'm so depressed. I mean, I can't tell you. you know, it's just it's horrible, you know? And I said, I'm a family gathering. I'm so happy today. I see my family, my nephews and nieces, and like, oh my God, I can't tell you. Like this, my two, two sisters and one of my brothers, now my other brother is okay, and uh, I mean, he said something to me that just bothered me. It's just, you know, it just was horrible. You know, it's just, I came home and, you know, my sister was laying into me. I was staying over at her house the night. She knows a little different background in my video. So, okay, so I, then I started making this connection. And oddly enough, maybe God put it in me. I used to get this uh, magazine that's no longer published, the Omni magazine. Some of you a little older might know about it. It's like a science fiction magazine, but I was kind of into it because it had a lot of things about psychedelics, which, you know, because I was like into drugs and, you know, like it actually caused my downfall. And I saw a lot of, they had this thing called Continuum, which, you know, I didn't really read the science fiction. I didn't care too much. I, again, I'm like, people seem to know it's probably a science fiction geek. No, I, I hate science fiction, you know? Finally, I started watching some of the Star Treks on Netflix, and they were kind of good. I never watched Star Wars. I always thought that was dumb. I always like nonfiction. So, so I on the in the continuum. So I read that every, epi, you know. I'd always buy Omni. I wish I would have saved them. Such a good the continuums and the psychedelics and the, and then I saw this thing about evolutionary psychology. Said, Holy shit! That's what I thought about. You know, like I thought about it. Clearly, I know this was a, a long time. You know, this stuff was this was around. Um. um and then, you know, time went on, and I saw a couple of things, places, and, you know, maybe I saw a book in the library about it, but in 1994, um, Robert Wright, who's a journalist, I think, you know, he had, in New York, he came out with a very good book called uh, The Moral Animal, which I read, and I couldn't put down, and he basically talked a lot about it, and um, he mostly talked about uh, kin selection and reciprocal altruism, uh, as um, is two main things about uh, evolutionary psychology. You know, a quick thing about both of them. Um, you know, first of all, kin selection is, um, you know, the idea that, you know, first of all, what do we want to do is uh, we want to, uh, you know, reproduce. And why do we want to reproduce? Because we're going to die. So we're going to talk you know, more about that you know, later in this podcast so we want to pass on our genes, right? And, um, but, you know, sometimes, so we do everything really for ourselves, you know? But sometimes it could be beneficial, you know, mathematically, or they even figured it out, that sometimes we might be altruistic. That means we might do behaviors that could cost us. You know, you might jump in the water to save somebody, but it could kill us. You might take a risk if it were you know, help, let's say, our child. Why? Because that child has, and we have a paternal investment in him, or maybe a brother, or maybe a cousin, you know, under certain situations, maybe a friend, or whatever it is. And reciprocal altruism, well, why do we uh, have friends? And, um, and the reason we have friends is that it's beneficial because I kiss your ass, you kiss my ass, and we're both better off, right? Right, reciprocal altruism. And, you know, one of the things is that um, if we both maintain a good relationship, we're, you know, we're better off. But, you know, a lot of <laughs> friends always have arguments and they basically, you know, when the, when the relationship <laughs> doesn't go good, like I give something to you and you don't give something to me, I get angry and vice versa. You give something to me and I'll give something to you. Uh, by the way, another author, I, you know, as I went on, if I read The Moral Analyst, I looked around, and one of the better authors, you know, and again, I have a lot of money, I go on YouTube and uh, do a search on David Buss, or he has a, a few good books. If you have some money, get the textbook. You'll probably get, you could probably get an older edition. It's probably all the same. Uh, his textbook on evolutionary psychology is probably all you need. And uh, so you have some dough. It's, it's probably worth it, okay? Okay, so 
And now he talks about some beginning uh, issues. So what is evolutionary psychology in a nutshell? So I say a nutshell because I prior podcast I explained a lot of this. So I'll, I'll probably at the end just refer you to it. I don't have to go over old territory. Um, um, and so one of the, the beginnings, there's actually two books. One is by, and I never read it, <laughs> it's by E.O. Wilson. It's called Sociobiology. And I, <laughs> by the way, evolutionary psychology is very much not liked. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, sociobiology, especially <laughs> by E.O. Wilson, you know, it's, you know, it's very similar to uh, evolutionary psychology, and especially the left does not like it for reasons I don't understand, uh, because it's well-researched, it's, you know, it's pretty much the truth at this point. Um, women, there are women researchers, it's not, you know, men just do it, you know, do the research, um, so I never read, I never knew about much of E.O. Wilson's work. Uh, E.O. Wilson is American uh, a biologist, and he wrote this book. He did a lot of research with ants, but he had the last chapter, I think, was about how this could apply to humans. Now, the real beginner was, you know, eventually he's not really like that much. Uh, Richard Dawkins, of course, the famous writer of the 2006 work, the God Delusion in his English accent, who I love. You know, we were talking about him at the Thanksgiving dinner today. Oh, he's a little nasty. Yeah, he is, and he's right, you know. Because, and uh, he wrote the famous 1976 book, which was a popular thing, uh, the, uh, the Selfish Gene, right? And then the basic premise, and some, again, to this day, some people, but it was a really big book back then, and a lot of people were against it. And the basic idea was that what a species from cockroaches to roses to humans to uh, frogs, you know, um, all species are just mortal vehicles created by immortal genes, right? The genes, you know, well, not necessarily immortal, but the genes make, genes cannot, you know, you know, genes are just there, but they can't... Um, Survive, so they have to create a vehicle, you know, and this vehicle they've created that can reproduce. So reproduction is really important; it's the ultimate goal of the gene. So they have to create the vehicles, and they've done that in different ways. It you know, just happens that human beings are one of their ways. That said, the fundamental I can't understand that. It's too hard. No, we're better than everything else. Well, we are smarter and we can change the earth, but no, we're pretty much, from an evolutionary point of view, similar to a cockroach, right? We eat, we may reproduce, and at some point we're going to die, right? Um, so that's point one. So species are just mortal ve vehicles created by immortal genes. Okay, number two, since the ve vehicles are mortal, that is, we die, the vehicles make duplicates of themselves, right? Right? And during their lifetime, right? So the genes have created these mortal vehicles and so to make sure the genes keep alive, because if they didn't, you know, they would die and that would not be make sense. And you might ask, well, why don't you just make immortal vehicles? That's a good question. And maybe Richard Dawkins can answer that. I don't know. It's a good question. Um so they have to make their vehicles able to reproduce, right? Which is make duplicates of themselves. You know, a lot of questions come on this, you know, like for instance, uh, homosexuals, which theoretically can't reproduce, okay? And, um, you know, and there's answers to that too, you know? And homosexuals, for example, can have relatives and those relatives can reproduce thereby passing on their genetic material. Okay, so theoretically, the genes can actually be immortal based on this process, but of course, life isn't so easy, right? So let's say an individual of a species, let's you know, stick with humans, is born, and uh, so during an individual's lifetime, an individual species might not get a chance to make duplicates of themselves, reproduce. 
because of certain reasons, okay? So one is the individual might get not get enough food. So individuals need food to grow and to, to grow to a certain level to have the ability to reproduce, right? So they need, they don't at first have enough, you know, certain species immediately within days, within maybe a few minutes that you gather, you know, a few seconds, maybe if you're a bacteria, you know, if you're a dog, maybe a year, maybe an elephant, maybe, you know, maybe 20 years, a human being, maybe 12, 13 years. Um, so, okay, so you need food, right? You need food. That's like the first thing you need. And for some reason, you know, um, you might not get that food. And there's many reasons. There's famine, there's, you know, there's, you know, generally speaking, there's a shortage of food. There's not enough food to go around, unfortunately. Usually people or things, and you know, animals or individuals of species produce more offspring than they can by design, just as a safety mechanism, evolution has designed that. So they've designed individuals through sex to produce many offspring, not knowing that many of these offspring will not survive. So, you know, going back in history of humans, you know, humans had sex and they had no contraception, and maybe 10 of them you may have 10 children, let's say, and maybe three, two, three, would survive, the rest would die. And many of them, starvation is a very, very bad life. So you might say, wow, that sucks. Yes, <laughs> you know, we're much better off. You know, complain about life. Life sucks. I'm my like, boss, you know, it's much better, you know. Um, so starvation probably should have been, you know, looking at, well, that should have been a part of the next thing. Well, maybe not. Okay, so the next reason is a, a whole thing. Well, actually, two. Intraspecies competition. So within the species, there's comp competition. Now, one of them is mate hoarding, okay? <laughs> mate hoarding. Uh, I used to be a hoarder. I'm not really a hoarder. It's just lazy. And um, so what happens sometimes, and this is especially in the human species, so males and, um, you know, in some societies like Saudi Arabia, the um, male of the species you know, takes on multiple wives, okay? Now, the problem is uh, women only have short reproductive lives, you know? So you might say, well, w you know, how long is that? Well, let's say, generally speaking, from 12 to like 43 or 44, and then you say, well, you know, reproductive capabilities because the woman... A girl isn't fully mature, I'd say like 15, although I had a student once who had a baby at 12, so we know it does happen. Let's say like 15 to 43, and then once you start getting a 40, it's not a good idea. So let's say 12 to 43. So females become, you know, those ages become very, very valuable, and the males compete over them. And some males, you know, in like something like Saudi Arabia, they take multiple wives, and just doing the math, if you take four wives, a whole bunch of guys take four wives, and take three guys, do not take wives. They get wives, and they're not gonna be very happy. So, um, maid hoarding, and then, you know, you might say, well, does that happen in a Western country, uh, like the United States, and sure, <laughs> it's called serial monogamy, as pointed out by, um, Robert Wright in his book, and so what is serial monogamy? That's the situation where you know, he gave Johnny Carson the example in his book. You know, so first Johnny Carson had three wives. So he, had, you know, when he was young, he had one wife, and you know, the wife got old, you know, and he got rid of her. And so he got another wife, and the wife got old, got rid of her, and had his final wife, and she got old, and I guess he stayed with her to the end, and. You beat, I think, all three of them at some point. And you know, Donald Trump did kind of the same. Low, I think Marla Maples. So he got Ivanka, but she was getting old. He got rid of her. He got Marla Maples. She wasn't that old, actually. So it was kind of weird he got rid of her. But he probably had all kinds of concubines. So, you know, it was just, you know, a woman just kept on the side. And then he got the, what's the other one? Uh, 
the one he has now, Melania. He's been cheated on her, Stormy Daniels. Uh, so that's called serial monogamy. Um, so many men don't get to reproduce, like me, because of this, right? Uh, murder and violence, okay? So many interspecies competition might not make it, you know, might have plenty of food. And especially young men, there's someone crazy, like the murder rate for you know, many societies, especially non-Western societies, like five times greater for individuals like 18 to 23 than it is for any other gauge group because they're competing at this time because this is the time you get the best mates. You know, you get the young, fertile mates who have long pre reproductive lives and murder and violence is a way you get eliminated from the... Uh, of the um, gene pool, so now you can't reproduce. Okay, another reason is called inter, in, so we had interspecies competition, now we have interspecies competition, and um, first one is disease. So you might not think, well, disease is not interspecies. Well, yes, yeah, some aren't, you know, because cancer and heart disease, well, heart disease might be, because it's caused many times by a virus, right? Um, or maybe tobacco uses, because maybe we evolved tobacco. <laughs> you know, we grew tobacco and we evolved it. We made it so good that people you know, say, oh, wow, this is really good. You smoke it, and then we get lung cancer and heart disease and all kind of other kinds of fun stuff. Um, so maybe that is sort of, but, um, you know, but you say, well, there are diseases like bacteria that... Uh, toxa, toxoplasmosis and, uh, you know, other diseases that um, compete for, you know, resources that we have. And I also put parasitism, but that's, you know, kind of a, a disease too. Um, and, of course, another interspecies uh, competition is predation, right? So, what you know, it's rare with us in these days, but it does happen. Uh, lions sometimes eat us and... Tigers sometimes eat us, and sometimes they go to the zoo, and <laughs> they don't have good cages, and the um, the uh, tiger escapes, or the bear escapes, and sometimes you go on camping trips, or, you know, the bear gets us, and, you know, sometimes some idiot goes swimming, <laughs> you know, in the Southern California, and the, the shark eats them, and, you know, or someone has a pit bull, and, you know, some moron has a pit bull, oh, the pit bull's so nice. And the pit bull attacks a kid and eats him. You know, so, you know, so it happens, but rarely in human society, you know, much more likely to, <laughs> you know, get, you know, interspecies competition, you get killed or murdered by some nut with a gun, and just comes and just starts shooting people. So, um, okay, point number four. Uh, these problems create adaptive behavior. So these problems have happened... Um, throughout mankind or you know, all species, right? And they've pushed the development of species. So the species we see today, from lions to tigers to roses who have thorns to cockroaches to uh, whales or whatever it is. But, you know, again, we center our conversation around humans. Um, these problems create adaptive behaviors to solve problems, Right? Most of the behaviors were developed in three, uh, in, were, were, were happened in one of three periods. So human beings have, throughout their history, uh, gone through three periods, right? You might say, well, what are those three periods, okay? So the first period is really long. It's, it's um, occurred in the other one, right? First one is our hunter-gatherer period, which... Um, was about 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. Now, hunter-gatherers really uh, don't really exist anymore, okay? Um, there might be pockets of them in South America. I think there's a tribe called the Aki, but again, they have some modern accoutrements. I like that word. I think they have T-shirts, they have, you know, but I think they still use bow and arrows, and, you know, um, spears to hunt prey, you know. I think they just, some kind of missionary, says, I'm going to preach the word of Jesus to the Zeki tribe. And so he went down to kill them. So, you know, um, I guess uh, Darwinian selection, he, uh, uh, I guess the, um, 
I guess in terms of Darwinian selection, uh, he was taken out of the gene pool for stupidity, I guess. Uh, that would be uh, interspecies competition, murder and violence, but he actually had murder, violence, and stupidity. You know what I'm saying? So he was dumb enough to believe there's a God, and uh, Jesus, you know, he believed, ran the Bible, and he said, well, to get to heaven, I got to go down, and I got to teach these savages how to, how to, oh, wait, I shouldn't say that savages, you can call them savages, they, you know, moral relatives and whatever they believe is right, you know, and I got to go down and I got to um, show them the word of God so they go to heaven, right? Because if they don't know, they're going to go to hell. At least I teach them that if they don't believe in Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, they're going to go to hell. So now they know at least, then they can make an informed decision, right? <laughs> I'm back to where I start. Between my family and this nonsense, it's just and I was just like, oh, this is terrible. No, it's not terrible. It's good. <laughs> you know, it's like it's good. This happened to this guy. It's just natural selection working. He's taken out of the gene pool. One more dumb Christian done. Okay. Um, okay. So hunter gatherer is the biggest period. Okay. The second period is the agricultural period, which should not last long. Okay, so then people said, well, you know, it's a pain in the ass, so you got to hunt down the animals. They started to say, well, these certain animals, you know, they come to us, you know, like these uh, sheep, these cattles, you know. And some of them are kind of nice, you know. Why don't we just start mating them, you know? We'd take the ram and the sheep, we we'll take these ca cattles, and, you know, the bulls aren't so nice, but we'll put them in pens and, you know, we'll stick some cows in and, well, ah, you know, you got, you know, we got kids, and we, you know, grazing on grass, which is plenty. And after a while, we we'll just chop the heads off and bingo, you know. And then we don't have to go around, and you know, we'll plant crops, and you know, we'll plant corn, and we'll plant the, you know, and it'll be very easy. Um, so, okay, sometimes you burn a load. I hate this fucking. <laughs> so it's going to be very easy. And then the final period, and by the way, that's a little more than 10,000 years ago. Uh, probably 11,000, 12,000, who the fuck knows. Okay. And then finally, there was the industrial period, okay? And um, the industrial period is about 220 years ago, give and take. And that's when we started to mechanize things. Now, you know, all farming is done by machines, you know, and it's very efficient and it's really good, you know. What I mean? People say, "Oh, you know, the world's a terrible place." You know, we lost all kinds of things. Yeah, it's true, but it's better. You know, it's like, you know, in fact, I was with my family, and I was like, "You know, being alone is not such a bad thing." You know, I like the solitude, get away from fucking everyone. I mean, you know, it's funny because again, I was telling you, I've been alone, and I'm trying to think. I mean, this is not such a bad thing. You know, now what's important in evolutionary psychology? Why do they bring these three periods up? Since our brain had developed. Mostly, you know, to, to about to say it was 200,000 years, just to give you an example. Um, I think that you have to realize that that period is when most of our brain develops. So the hunter gatherer period is the one that is the period that evolutionary psychologists are most interested in. So, um, that is why um, people are, um, that's why people are, um, people are, um, you know, people are, um, you know, that's why evolutionary college is called, it's called, by the way, uh, the EEA, the Evo Environment of Evolutionary Adaptation, the EEA, okay? So when you see that in, you know, in a book, it, the EEA is important. That explains many, like the dominant male or the, you know, silverback, you know. A lot of, by the way, a lot of studies on uh, evolutionary psychology are taken from animals, you know like primates and, you know, bower birds and, and, um, okay, so to get this in there, I'm going to go a little over, but about a half an hour. Now, 
what are some of the behaviors? Now, since I did a podcast already, um, please um, go to um, uh, podcast number eight and you do a search on mate preferences in the human male and human female. They'll talk about, you know, how this works into humans more. So you'll find out about what males want, what females want, this whole, you know, behavior. Why males, if you're female, why are men the way they are? They're so fucked up. And you know, if you're a man, of course, you know why females are fucked up. And, you know, the, I think I mentioned some theories about homosexuality. And um, so, you know, thank you. And uh, have a great Thanksgiving. Bye-bye.